when you have information, sometimes you need to present it or you need to interpret other people's presentations of information. One way you can organize and display data, this is not actually that commonly used in everyday life. Uh, it's basically a histogram except the bars are chains of numbers that actually specify what the individual data points are as opposed to a histogram which just says there are this many within this bin, this range of numbers. Like say if this bin was 190 to 199, the, this, if this was just a bar, it would tell you that there were three numbers in the 190s. So from 190 to 199, you wouldn't know what the numbers exactly were. But with a stem and leaf plot, you do know what they are. The front section of the number is the group, the stem, and the rear section is given as individual data points. So say this, this is 192, 195, 197. The stem, the front part, is 19, so 19. And the leaf, well, it can be 2, so 192, 5, 195, or 7 for 197. And for 202 and 205, the stem is 20, and the leaves are 2 and 5. And for 211, the stem is 21, and the leaf is 1. You can also organize this with, say, the first number as your stem. So you have 1, and then 92, 1, 95, and 1, 97. Or you can have 2, 02, 202, or 2, 0, 05, and 2, 11. What's the difference between this and just writing all the numbers out in just a row? Well, as you can see, you can easily categorize the ranges of numbers into a few categories. And this is really useful if you're, say, making a histogram. Like, you could just say, this bin is 190 to 199, and boom, you know exactly how long your histogram bar is going to be. Uh, of course, if this was an actual histogram, all these bars would be the same width, and they would touch each other because the ranges are directly adjacent to each other. It's not like a bar graph where you have red cars, green cars, completely separate categories. There's no in-between. Here it's going to be 190 to 199, 200 to 209, 210 to 219. I mean, technically we know that they're not actually directly adjacent to each other, but uh, some rounding is being applied. Like, say, you're talking about the prices of cars. Oh, you go from zero to $9,999, and then the next category starts at $10,000. Uh, I bought this car for $9,999.99, so $9,999.99. Hmm. Yeah, no. That's like overthinking the problem a lot. And besides, you would just round if you're making a histogram. Because those bins on a histogram are supposed to be just touching each other. All right, let's display these data points in a stem and leaf plot. So we see that we have 23, 15, uh, 15 to 56. Looks like the range is 15 to 56, the smallest to largest values. Okay, so our stems would be 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Now the leaves, for 1, we have 5, we have 7, and we have 5 again. So 5, 5, and seven, we cross these out to make sure that we don't double count. For twos, well, we have a three, we have an eight, and we have a five. Okay, so three, five, and eight. 
Okay, what about the 30s? We have 32, 33, 34, 37. 32, 33, 34, 37. 3, 4, and 7. Okay, what about the 40s? Oh, we have 41 and 47. And the 50s? Oh, we have 56. And that's it. So this is our stem and leaf plot. For our exercises, we will display a few more stem and leaf plot. Here we have oh, 18, 19, up to 39. So the stems are predictably 1, 2, and 3. And the leaves, well, you can use leaves, plural, or just leaf. Uh, there's no serious convention constraints there. So 18 and 19. For the 20s, we have 24, we have 27, and we have 27 again. Okay, what about the 30s? Oh, we got 33, 35, and 39. 33, 35, and 39. 35, 39. And that's it. Now, a stem and leaf plot also may make it easier to find, say, your median or your quartiles. Because while you're writing this out, you are also writing out your numbers from smallest to largest. Technically, you could be doing it from largest to smallest, but that's like not very popular. So, here we have 77 and 80s and 90s. So, stem 7, 8, 9. Now the leaves. 77, get rid of that, and then for the 80s, we have 83, 88, 88, and 87, so 3, and then we got an 87, and we got two 88s, 8 and 8, and for the 90s, we got 94, 95, and 99, 5 and 9. Okay, that's it. Suppose the above data sets are the maximum speeds of roller coasters in kilometers per hour in the child and adult sections of an amusement park. What's the speed of the fastest roller coaster in the child section? Oh, we look at the largest number, which is going to be 39. child is 39 kilometers per hour. You can also write kph. Yes, I realize grammatically this looks really interesting. <laughs> anyway, uh, the slowest adult roller coaster, we're just going to write slowest adult. Adult is 77 kilometers per hour. What is the median speed of all the roller coasters? How many data points do we have? Oh, we got 8 for the child coasters and 8 for the adult coasters. Uh, by the way, 18 kilometers per hour for your slowest child coaster's maximum speed is actually a lot. 18 kilometers per hour is 5 meters a second. The actual slowest roller coasters in the world are like pedestrian paced, okay? Like the actual children's coasters you can find at amusement parks. Like they're hilarious. Anyway, uh, median speed, oh, that's just going to be the fastest child coaster and the slowest adult coaster averaged because 
it is between the eighth and ninth numbers when you write from smallest to largest or vice versa. Which means it's going to be the average of 39 and 77. Do we need a calculator for this? The answer is no. Because 37 and 77 average out to 57 and 39 is 2 greater than 37. So 57 plus half of 2 is 58 kilometers per hour. This is the other notation you can often see for kilometers per hour. I'm using various notations so that you guys will note the uh, differences. Measures of variation. The range and the interquartile range describe how a set of data varies. The range is the difference from the biggest to the smallest values. So biggest minus smallest. The median is the value that separates the data set in half when you order it smallest to largest or vice versa. If there's an even number of data points, you take the average of the middle two. The lower quartile or first quartile as I generally uh, learned it, Q1 is the median of the lower half of the set of data. The upper quartile or third quartile, Q3, is the median of the upper half of the set of data. And the interquartile range is Q3 minus Q1, so the difference between the first and third quartiles. Now an outlier is a data point, or any data in general, because you can have multiple of these, that's more than one and a half times the value of the interquartile range beyond Q1 or Q3. Oh, right, from your direction, Q1 is probably over here, and then Q3 is over there, right. So, find the range, interquartile range, and any outliers for each set of data. The range we write this out from smallest to largest first. So 3, well you start with a 2, and then there's an 8, and then there's a 12, two 14s, and then a 17 and a 21. So, the range nineteen because it's twenty one minus two. The interquartile range, well, Q two equals thirteen. So Q two is median, by the way. It's a second quartile. The first quartile, Q one, is equal to eleven over two. And Q3 is equal to 15.5 or 31 over 2. So the interquartile range is equal to 31 over 2 minus 11 over 2 will give you 20 over 2 which is 10. And are there any outliers that are more than one and a half times the IQR? Please note that this depends on convention. In some conventions I've seen three times IQR. And in some others, such as say when you're doing uh, diagrams for scientific studies, you may not bother noting outliers at all on your box and whisker plots, which, by the way, we'll be covering a little later. So you just go straight from the end of the quartiles to the extreme values for your whiskers. Anyway, do we have any that are more than 15 beyond either quartile? Well, no, we got no outliers. 
No outliers. Now for this stem and leaf plot that we have down here, we have how many numbers? We got 6 times 2, 12, plus 3 plus 2, so plus 5. 12 plus 5 is 17 numbers. So number 9 should be the median. Q2 is equal to 27. Okay then, that leaves us 8 numbers for the first half and 8 numbers for the second half. Q1 is equal to the median of these, which is going to be the average of 20 and 22. So 21. Q3 is equal to, it's between 34 and 35. So 34.5. The IQR is therefore equal to 34.5 minus 21, which leaves us 13.5. Okay, then. Are there any outliers? Well, remember the definition of outlier is one and a half interquartile ranges beyond the Q1 and Q3 values. So, do we ha even have one IQR beyond these? No because 43 is not that far beyond 34.5. And 13 isn't that far less than 21. Okay, what else did we have to find? Oh, we had to find the range. The range is range is 43 minus 13, which is 30. Let's do some exercises. This data is from the maximum and minimum speeds recorded during the second lap of a go-kart race. Find the range, that means the slowest of your minimum speeds to the largest of your maximum speeds. Oh, by the way, if you have a two-way stem and leaf plot like this, this, for example, means 20, 20, 21, 21, 22, 23, 28, 29. Note that we go from the least being closest to the stem to the most being furthest away from the stem. On whichever side you're putting your information on. Find the range. Okay, range is... And we know that there are 13 data points on each side, 13 and 13, which makes sense because any one racer will have a maximum speed and a minimum speed. So range is equal to the fastest of the total number of data points, which is 43, minus the slowest. 43 minus 16, so 27, and median, well, median, you can't just say, oh, the fastest of the minimums average with the slowest of the maximums, because there's some overlap. Apparently, somebody here is really skilled, and the minimum speed they had was 30 kilometers, whereas somebody else had a maximum speed of 28 kilometers per hour. Yeah, uh, Somebody's not probably not winning this race. Anyway, so what is the median then? Well, we count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Wait a second. It's the average of the thirteenth and fourteenth data point. Which means we're looking at 29 and 29. 
median equals 29. Upper quartile, well, that's Q3, is equal to, now we know Q3 is going to be the median of the top 13. And we see that here there are 7, and here there is 3, here there is 1 more, so we have 11, and then 12 and 13 are 2 of the 29s. Okay. And, well, if we count back among those 13, we are going to find the 7th one is the median of those. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So, Q3 is 34. Q1 is the first 13. You take the median of those, and it's got to be the seventh one from smallest to largest. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So that's going to be 1 for the leaf, and the stem is 2, so 21. Okay, what's the IQR? IQR is equal to Q3 minus Q1, which means 34 minus 21, so 13. Because an outlier is... Anything that's more than 1.5 IQRs outside your quartiles, there are no outliers here. All right, let's write a sentence that compares the data. Well, the fastest min speed exceeded the slowest max speed. Slowest max speed. Max speed. Yeah, that's about it for what we can say comparing this data. Because that's the most an uh, obvious thing about it. However, we could also say that the typical minimum speed was appreciably less than the typical maximum speed, which is pretty much to be expected. Okay, let's talk about box and whisker plots, also known as box plots. So, each of these parts contains 25% of the data. This is Q2 here, this is Q1, this is Q3, and this is the minimum value, this is the maximum. Sometimes you see these uh, range ticks, like kind of like this, on them. Uh, and I have seen people actually draw box plots with the line passing through, but, well... But it's not the norm, as far as I understand. So the box shows your interquartile range. Or should I say, the boxes show your quartiles. Including your second quartile, i.e. the median. Alright, let's say we have the heat levels of some peppers shown in the table. Display the data in a box and whisker plot. Well, uh... This is from 0K, 8K, 25K, 120K, and 210K. So Q2 is just 25K. The median of the first half, Q1 equals 4K. Q3 is the average of 120k and 210k, which is 330k divided by 2, 165k. So, 
What would a box and whisker plot look like? Well, importantly, are there any outliers? Because on a box and whisker plot, you would show outliers as just points. Okay? Like, say, out here or something. Yes, I do realize this isn't necessarily one and a half IQRs outside, but the point remains, literally, that you just use points to show your outliers. <clears throat> Are there any outliers? Oh, from 4K to 165K, that's like over 160K, specifically 161K of range for interquartile range, which means that to go past that, yeah, you're going to need a lot more than habaneros. So, your box and whisker plot would look something like this. This is not exactly to scale. And this would go pretty far out. So, Q2 equals 25K. If you don't have a number line to reference as you're making your box and whisker plot, it is strongly advised that you label your quartiles and your minimum and maximum values. Or at least the minimum and maximum values that were not uh, outliers. Okay. So let's draw a box and whisker plot for each set of data here. Well first, we've got to order this and find where our quartiles are. So the smallest is 5, and then we got 12 and 17. 17 and 22, 26, 28. 28, 22, 26, 28, 33, 35, 41, 35, 41. Well then, the Q2 value is just 26. It's a median. There's nine po data points. The fifth one is it. Okay, Q1 is 29 over 2. And Q3 is 34. Okay, so a box and whisker plot of this would be dealing with 14.5 to 34. So if this is about 20, where is 20, if this is a range of about 20, between 14.5 and 34, where is 26? Oh, it's a bit more than halfway. Q2 equals 26. Do you actually have to write Q2, though? Well, no, it's a box and whisker plot, so it's already known what your, the ends of your box actually mean. 29 over 2, and 34. So you can just label the, them by value. If this represents 19.5, so just under 20, how far is 34 to 41 going to be in comparison? Which is 7. Oh, it's going to be about a third this much. So it looks something like this. You would label it 41. And on this side, from... 14 and a half to 5, oh, that's 9 and a half, so about half this much, which leaves you out to here. So, 5. Now, what about these sums of money? Well, we got to order them. Considering the number of numbers here, it would have been perfectly reasonable to just gone stem and leaf 
and then maybe redone it to reorganize all the leaves into a smallest to largest order. Anyway, 17 numbers. Well, if we're looking for Q2, 17 numbers means we're looking for the ninth number. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. This is where your second quartile is. Okay, then, now what about your first and third quartiles? Well, your third quartile is these eight, the median, which is 47.5, Q3 equals. And your first quartile, oh, it's going to be between 12 and 13. Q1 equals 12.5. Okay, then since we're drawing a box and whisker plot, that means... So, 12.5 to 47.5 is how much? Oh, it's 35. Hmm. Let's just say this is 35, because we don't have a scale to go off of. There's no number line down here to work with. So let's say this is 35 units long. So from 12.5 to 29, which is almost 30, is how much? Well, if it was 30, it would be exactly between these two. 17.5 either way. However, it's not, so we move it a little bit off-center. And we go, oh, this is 29, and this is 12.5, and this is 47.5. And then what? Oh, uh, the interquartile range is 35. Is 78 the largest number going to be an outlier then? Well, no, 35 plus 47.5 is rather more than that. So it's not an outlier. How far is it, though? Oh, it's just over 30. This is supposed to be 35, therefore it'll be a little bit shorter. So somewhere around here. So this looks about right. And then we label this 78. Now from 12.5 to 5 is 7.5. This here is 35. 7.5 is how much compared to 35? Well, not very much, first of all. Uh, it's going to be just a little bit over a fifth as much. So we look at how much is a fifth. So around this much. Okay, this is five. And there we go. That's sketching a box and whisker plot. On the other hand, if you have a number line for reference, please use the number line for scaling purposes. And also, if you are able to use a ruler on whatever writing implement you're dealing with, please do use a ruler. Uh, try to make it to scale, or at least reasonably so. I don't have 5 over here be longer than 10 over there or something. But, yeah, uh, usually, unless you put it on next to a diagram, this is to scale. Never assume in math class that a diagram is to scale. Okay, let's talk about histograms. Histograms use bars. It's a type of bar graph, right? Well, uh, it's used to display numerical data or continuous data that's been organized into equal intervals. So bar graphs are for categorical data, like red cars, blue cars. Numerical data would be like the heights or weights of people in your class. There's no space between bars because these equal intervals have no gaps between them. And if they look like they do have a gap, like say 3,999 to 4,000, yeah, um... If we're dealing with this like a histogram, that means you round to the nearest single unit. Okay? Because the intervals are equal, all of the bars have the same width, and intervals with a frequency of zero have no bar. The one exception to the equal width may be the last interval. 
and also maybe the first interval because you can have less than or equal to something or greater than something. So for example, the frequency table here shows the highest elevation in each US state. If you display this in a histogram, it looks like this. The frequency dictates the length of the bar or column, because you could do a histogram horizontal, with horizontal bars. Uh, these, we call them bars all the time, but uh, according to Excel at least, these are columns. So the columns are all the same width because the intervals are equal and if you don't have any in a bin, so if you have no data points in an interval, you don't have a bar. And these bars touch because the intervals touch. Okay, that's relatively straightforward. It's so like a bar graph except with intervals that are manually defined and touching and equally sized instead of categories like say apples, oranges. So for these exercises use the information shown in the table below for a class's range when doing shot put with a light shot. Shot put you basically have a light shot well, light compared to the old lead shots they used, or iron shots they used for uh, cannons. But anyway, you have a piece of lead shot. So nowadays they just use a metal ball, which is usually not actually lead anymore, I hope. Or at least it's coated with something that prevents it from rubbing off too much on your hand and giving people lead poisoning, I hope. Anyway, you use it and you basically just shove it instead of throwing because throwing you're probably going to do something really bad to your arm with an a, uh, item that you're throwing that's that heavy and has that poor leverage. It's not like throwing a stock hand grenade where you at least have the leverage effect reducing the burden. It's just a metal chunk. How do we know it's a light shot? Well somebody managed to make it 15 to 20 meters which is like really, really a lot. So sketch a histogram for this data. Well, the vertical axis should actually read students. So I kind of left that out just so that we could still have something to write. And the horizontal axis is labeled with the intervals and we can see the columns are joined together. Now whether you actually have say lines dividing these columns, uh, conventions may vary slightly on that, but if you all have them uh, solid colors, it might seem like they're not divided at all. Which is kind of the point of a histogram because the intervals touch. So if you have four students who manage to put the shot zero to five meters away, hence why it's called shot put, you're putting a shot, except a little bit more uh, troublesome than just r reaching over and putting it down. <coughs> and you got four students who did that, okay, the column height is four. You got 10 students who made it five to 10 meters, the column height is 10. Eight students who made it 10 to 15 meters, oh, the height is 8. And one student who got really far, 15 to 20 meters, the column height is 1 for that bin or that interval. How many students managed to land the shot 10 meters or further? Well, that would be the 10 to 15 meters and the 15 to 20 meters range which means nine students. Now how many students failed to reach 15 meters? Well that's everybody except this last person. So it's 10 plus 8 plus 4 which gives us 22 such students. There are many ways to display data.
like say bar graphs, column graphs. Yeah, okay, that's like only a distinction you find on Excel. Otherwise, you have horizontal bars and vertical bars. <clears throat> Uh, box and whisker plots, circle graphs, frequency tables, histograms, line graphs, line plots, stem and leaf plots, tables, and Venn diagrams. Here we have a table that shows the number of houses occupied in the U.S. from 1980 to 2003. You could use a bar graph for this, no problem. However, for things that are changing over time, usually you would use a line graph. On the other hand, the intervals between the data points are different. Like that's five year intervals and then it's one year intervals. So, notice how the horizontal axis is very explicitly marked. But even then, in some places, the convention is that you can't change the axis scaling without showing some sort of break in the whole graph. Okay? Conventions vary, so be very careful about this. Notice that this line graph has a scale change. This may or may not be okay where you live. Now let's say we got to show uh, a set of data that is not a change over time. In this case, it's categorical, so you have different players and there are points per game. You can show this by columns or bars, so a bar graph, because, well, how do these relate to each other? Is there some sort of change over a gradient? So some thing changing and then we show how something else changes with it? No. I mean, unless you're telling me that these are the top fives or something, in which case, yes, we know that the score decreases as you go down the top five. If this is supposed to be surprising or actually informative, They're the top, going from the top one to the fifth for a reason. You'd expect things to drop. If you're just showing the relative amounts and how they compare to each other, bar graphs are pretty good for this. What if we uh, change the scaling on this bar graph? Like say we had the horizontal axis be like 25 or something. It would look like Paul Pierce was absolute garbage compared to Allen Iverson, at least in this table. Yeah, that's what happens when you have misleading graphs. For example, here we see the number of events in the Summer Olympics from 1948 to 1996. There's been a steady increase, sure. But if you have your horizontal axis start be at zero and your vertical axis goes up pretty far, as opposed to, say, topping out at 300, which would still have made this seem a little bit more significant, then, well, your graph is going to look very different compared to if your horizontal axis begins very close to your lowest data point and your vertical axis ends very close to your highest data point. So what causes the graphs to differ in their appearance? Well, vertical axis, range, and scale. Now, which graph appears to show a more rapid increase in the number of events in the Summer Olympics? Explain. The one at left manipulates the scales to look steeper. Steeper. Due to vertical axis 
ICS manipulation. All right, then. Exercises. So here we have a few graphs for highest temperatures recorded as of the time when this graph was made in a few different states of the U.S. What is the highest recorded temperature when the graphs were made in California and in Alaska? Well, in California, California, it was 135 degrees Fahrenheit, and in Alaska, it was 100 degrees Fahrenheit. You can tell with this graph very easily. This graph, you lose some of the details, like say, is this 135? Hmm. We have to take a ruler to it. In which graph does the difference between these temperatures appear to be minimized? So which one does this gap look smaller? Obviously it's the graph B. Graph B. How do the graphs create different appearances? It's the vertical axis range and scale. Vertical axis range and scale. That's what makes them look different. Let's talk a bit about probabilities. Probability is the chance that some event will happen. So the probability of an event is the number of favorable outcomes divided by the number of possible outcomes. Like say we got a bag of marbles. Five red marbles, three yellow marbles, and two blue marbles. One marble is selected at random. Find the probability of each. Okay, probability of yellow. Well, there's how many? It's the number of yellow outcomes over the number total. So in other words, we're talking about 3 over 10. Now probability of blue or yellow, that's 2 plus 3 over 10. So 2 plus 3 over 10. Technically, this is because blue and yellow are mutually exclusive. P blue plus P yellow. But in this case, I just went N blue plus N yellow. So the number of outcomes that are blue plus the number of outcomes that are yellow over the number of total outcomes because they're mutually exclusive. So there are several approaches to this thing. P, red, blue, or yellow? Well, they're all red, blue, or yellow, which means the probability is one that you're going to get a red, blue, or yellow marble. The chance that you get a black marble is zero because there are no black marbles. It is impossible to get a black marble here. Let's do an exercise. A bag contains 10 red marbles, 10 blue marbles, 8 green marbles, 11 purple marbles, and 1 white marble. One is selected at random. Find the probability of each outcome expressed as a fraction and as a percent. So the chance of getting your white marble, how many marbles are there? Hmm. There's 10 plus 10, 20, plus 8, plus 11, plus 1, so plus 8, plus 12. So 40 total. So the chance of getting a white marble is 1 in 40, which is equal to 2.5%. The chance of getting a red marble is 10 in 40, which is 1 quarter, and 25%. The chance of getting a green marble, that's 8 in 40, 
which is 1 in 5, which is 20%. The probability of getting a purple marble, that's 11 in 40, which is equal to 27.5%. The chance of getting a white, blue, or green marble is 1 plus 8 plus 10. Well, I mean, 1 plus 10 plus 8, really. Over 40 total marbles, which leaves you with 19 over 40. Or, this is half minus 1 over 40, so 50 minus 2.5%, that leaves you with 47.5%. Now the chance of a red or blue, well, that's 20 over 40, because there's 10 red and 10 blue. I could have written 10 plus 10, though. Hmm. Anyway, that's 1 half, which is 50% chance of getting a red or a blue marble. Let's say we have red or purple marbles. Well, there are 10 red marbles and 11 purple marbles. So, 10 red plus 11 purple over 40 total marbles, which leaves us at 21 over 40, or 52.5% chance. The chance of getting a green or a purple marble. Oh, there's eight green marbles and 11 purple marbles. So that's going to be 8 plus 11 over 40, which is equal to 19 over 40 equals 47.5%. The chance of a green, purple, or white marble, green is 8, purple is 11, and white is 1, so equals 8 plus 11 plus 1 over 40, which leaves us with 20 over 40, or 1 half, 50%. So, red, blue, green, purple, or white, wait a second, that's the entire sample space, the entire set of possibilities. Hmm. Well then, that's 10 plus 10 plus 8 plus 11 plus 1 over 40, which means 40 over 40 equals 1, which is 100%. Now the chance of red, blue, or purple, that's got to be 10 red, 10 blue, and 11 purple marbles over a total of 40 marbles. So that's 31 over 40, which is 75% plus 1 over 40, 77.5 percent. So let's say we got to count outcomes. Because if we want to assess how big the sample space is, the number of possible outcomes, sometimes we got to count them. How many different combinations of drink and sandwich can be made from three drink choices and three sandwich choices? Well, for every drink choice, you have three sandwich choices. So, 3 by 3 equals 9 combos. Now I'm pretty sure if the teacher tells you to show your work you actually have to write for every drink you have three sandwich choices or you have to draw a tree diagram or something but we're not going to do that. Like no, unless specifically instructed we're going to avoid the ugh what are you doing that is tree diagrams. 
Refer to example 1. What is the probability of randomly selecting drink 2 with sandwich A? If you know the number of outcomes and you know the probability of each of them, you can calculate the probability that an event will occur. And if the outcomes are equally likely, you can actually have some of the outcomes be the same, uh, you can still calculate the probability that an event will occur. Like say, tossing a die and getting six after two tosses, like getting a total of six. Well then, we know that it could be one and five, we could be two and four, or three and three, or four and two, or five and one. Hmm. Each of those is equally likely. So you can calculate the probability that an event will occur because you know the total number of outcomes and the number of outcomes that give you the event. Example 1, what is the probability of randomly selecting drink 2 with sandwich A? Well, there were three drinks and three sandwiches. So, this is one-third chance of getting drink 2 times one-third equals one-ninth. Formulaically, you could say that this is B2A is this, but really what this step represents, and which is something you can usually leave out after maybe the first couple times you do the problem, is P drink two times P of sandwich A. Because these events are independent. The chance of one event does not affect the chance of the other event. Now let's say we do an exercise. Four coins are tossed. What is the probability of four tails? Well, probability of four tails is equal to the probability of tails to the fourth power. So one half to the fourth, so one sixteenth. Now two dice are rolled, and what is the probability that the sum is prime? When it tells you two dice, by default it means 2d6. So two si dice, six-sided. We are not talking about, say, 2D20 or 2D100 or 2D10 or 2D4 because there are many different uh, sizes of dice. Or, say, 2D8. I think that's about it for the common sizes. Anyway, two dice are rolled. What is the probability that the sum is prime? Well, we have two six-sided die. And prime sums are two, three, five, seven, eleven, and that's it. Okay, then P two D six equals prime. equals the probability that 2d6 equals 2, but we're just going to write probability of 2 plus the probability of 3 plus the probability of 5 plus the probability of 7 plus the probability of 11. So the probability of 2 is one way in 36 because you got to row 1 on both dice. Probability of 3, there are two ways in 36, because it's going to be 1, 2, 2, 1. Probability of 5, four ways in 36. You go from 1, 4 all the way to 4, 1. Probability of 7, you go from 1, 6 to 6, 1, which means there's going to be six ways in 36. And the probability of 11, well, what's the probability of 12? 
Oh, you got to get two sixes. Okay, 11, it's going to be 5, 6, or 6, 5. So there's two ways. This is symmetrical. The distribution of probabilities of each of these outcomes, it's symmetrical. What does these add up to? 4 plus 6 is 10. 2 plus 2 plus 1 is 5. So 15 over 36, which cancels out to 5 over 12. The probability that the sum is prime from 2d6 is 5 over 12. Okay, then, what if we gotta, say, uh, choose people for a team? Or how many ways this many people can have this many roles chosen? Well, do the roles differ? Are they the same? Hmm. Well, if the order is important, like the first person you choose is first place, the second person you choose is second place, and so on, then you're talking about permutations. So when you have 3 pick 2, for example, uh, the notation is NPR for N pick R, or PNR, or there's a few other notations as well. I generally use PNR as in the probability of N and R. That is why I prefer NPR by a long shot. So let's say you got to take five different sandwich components, like you have a slice of Oatmeal bread, you have a slice of rye bread, you have a tomato slice, you have a patty, and you have a slice of cheese. Okay? The order that you decide to stack them on your plate... Why on a plate? Well, it's because it gets kind of awkward if you're trying to eat with the tomato slice at the bottom and then the patty on top and you're holding it in your hand. So if you're trying to consider the order of these five different components, and you're using all of them, you would have five pick five. You have five choices for your first component, you have four choices left for your second component, three choices for your third, two choices for your fourth, and one choice for your last component. For every choice that you have for your first component, all five of them, you have four other choices for your second. That's why it's five times four and then times 3, times 2, times 1. But if you only pick a limited number, like say if you're only picking two different toppings for your pizza, and the first topping you pick will come in double the amount of the second, then the order matters. And that would be, say, out of five toppings, five choices for your first topping, times four other choices for your second topping. Like how 3 pick 2 would be 3 choices for your first one chosen, times 2 choices remaining for every first choice you made. And that would be equal to 6 for 3 times 2. 3 pick 2. Now, combinations, the order is not important. For example, if you're choosing salad components to mix together and you'll be using the same amount no matter what order that you pick them in, the order doesn't matter. And you would write this as NCR for N choose R or CNR. Anyway, the result is that you take the number of permutations you have and you divide by the number of permutations within the list. Like say, oh, uh, for six ingredients, 6 pick 3, I can have 6 choices for my first ingredient, times 5 choices for my second ingredient, times 4 choices for my third ingredient. Okay, but what happens if the order doesn't actually matter? Well, within all of these, how many ways have I managed to choose the same 3 ingredients just in different orders? Well, 6 choose 3 would be equal to 6 pick 3 divided by 3 pick 3. 
So this 3 pick 3 represents the number of different ways I could have chosen 3 things out of 3 things. This is going to be 6 by 5 by 4 divided by, there were 3 possibilities that I could have had for my first choice, times 2 times 1. Because within these 3 things that were chosen, I could have chosen them in 6 different orders. Those six different orders are represented down here. Yes, this can potentially take a while to work out, but the point of combinations is that, wait a second, if the order doesn't matter, we got to eliminate all the double counting we've done by dividing by the number of times we double counted for every single combination of items that we could have picked. So we divide by the number of permutations within each combination that could be made. So how many ways can the top four finishers be arranged in a 20-person cross-country race? This is permutations because you have four different places. Therefore, you got 20 pick 4, which means you got 20 choices for your first place times 19 choices remaining for your second place. For every single choice you could have made for first place, there are 19 choices for second place. For every choice of first and second place, you have 18 choices left for third place and then 17 for fourth place, okay? Right. That 20 times 19, 20 times 19 times 18 times 17 leaves us with 116280 ways. Now suppose we have a science class with 39 students. How many different three-person lab teams can be formed? Look. If this was back in division, as in like a few grades earlier, you could totally be like 13 different groups. Because 39 divided by 3. Yeah, but that's not what is being asked here. How many different three-person lab teams? The emphasis is on this part, not on the how many part. Okay. This means we're looking at 39 choose 3. So let's start off with, okay, let's say the order matters. Well, then we got 39 choices for our first person. And for every one of those, we got 38 choices for our second person. And for every one of these choices for first and second person, we got 37 choices for our third person. But to wait, within this group, we aren't dealing with group no member number one, group member number two, group member number three. No, we're dealing with group member, group member, and group member. So the order we chose them in doesn't matter. So within these three people, how many ways could we have arranged them? How, in what orders could we have chosen them? We could have chosen them 1, 2, 3. We could have chosen them 1, 3, 2. We could have chosen them 2, 1, 3. Or 2, 3, 1. Or 3, 2, 1. Or 3, 1, 2. Oh, hey. That's how many ways? That's six ways. There were three options for first person to have been chosen. Times two options for second person to have been chosen. And then one. So, for every permutation, there are a total of six permutations that have the exact same three people in the lab team, just picked in different orders. So, we got to get rid of all but one of those. So, we divide by six. Thus, we end up with 13... 38 gives you down to 19, so 13 times 19 times 37 
is 9,139 different three-person lab teams. Now, if you are picking a team leader, a team member, and a team scribe, those would be three different roles, and the order you pick them in would matter. But here, it's just three-person lab teams. It's just three team members. The order they picked doesn't matter. So hence, we have choose. Tell whether each situation is a permutation or combination, then solve. How many ways can three people be selected from a group of nine? Well, uh, we're just selecting three people, which means this is a combination because the order doesn't matter. It's not like we're choosing first, second, and third place. The combinations, we're dealing with nine choose three. So we got nine by eight by seven for the number of permutations divided by three by two by one for the number of orderings that could have happened for a given group of just three people with no particular ordering within these permutations. That's what we're dividing for. So, three and four. So we cancel a bit and we get three times four times seven. Or four times 21, which is 84 ways. How many ways can a six person kickball team be chosen from 30 students? The thing is, um, hmm. this depends on your familiarity with what kickball actually is. Because I get the impression that there are probably forwards, midfields, defense, and goalies. So in that case, it would be several permutations. And combinations, because within a given role, it doesn't actually matter. Hmm. But, assuming that these team members can hammer out who's doing what after the fact of being picked, <clears throat> are they picked? No, they're actually chosen. So we're choosing six people from these 30 students. <sighs> Because honestly, if this question is enough of a trick question that you're supposed to know what roles a kickball team has in what ratios in the particular version of the game, because if this is soccer, also known as football, compared to American football, which is more accurately hand egg, <coughs> well, hmm, rules may vary. So by that point, you might as well have the question just be, how many six-person kickball teams? And the answer would be five, because you have 30 students and you have six people per team. That is not what I think is happening here. So, 30 choose six would be... You might notice that it gets kind of awkward going like, 30 times 29 times 28 times 27 times 26 times 25. Hmm. Over 6 factorial. Yeah, so this is kind of awkward. What does this actually mean? This is actually 30 factorial over 30 minus 6 factorial. It's just that all the parts cancel out from 24 onward. And then you divide by 6 factorial. So a permutation is actually this part here. Yeah, that's how you do this easily on a calculator without going 30 times 29 times 28 times 27 and so on. So you have 30 
And then, where's the factorial key? Aha, there it is. Factorial divided by 24. Factorial. And divide by 6 factorial. Uh, we end up with 5, 9, 3, 7, 7, 5 ways that you can choose 6 people from 30 students. Yes, this looks rather large as a number. That's why the odds of actually winning the jackpot on, say, a lottery are so very low. How many ways can five books be ordered on a shelf from a collection of 50 books? Well, you're ordering the she books on a shelf. That means the order matters. This is a permutation problem. So this is a permutation problem, and you're dealing with 50 pick 5, which is equal to... Whether you subscript the uh, N and R part of N pick R may vary by convention. So this is 50 factorial over 50 minus 5 factorial. This will leave you with 50 times 49 times 48 times 47 times 46. So... Actually, I should just multiply uh, because I don't want to do anything funny to my calculator. So this ended up being 2, 5, 4, 2, 5, 1, 2, 0, 0 ways. Yeah, it's a lot. Permutations rapid, and combinations for that matter rapidly grow rather huge. However, in terms of combinations, imagine if you had to choose a combination of 20 items from 20 items. You'd end up with exactly one combination, which is choose them all. So yeah, combinations, once they pass the halfway point, they get smaller. Combinations, it's actually going to be symmetrical, the distribution. Permutations are not. All right, so let's say we have a company with 15 applicants for three identical entry-level positions. In how many ways can the firm choose these three employees? Well, choose. That doesn't actually indicate whether it should be N pick R or N choose R. Because words are sloppy. You look for the identical entry-level positions here. That's the important part. So this is, in fact, a choose question. Specifically, it's 15 choose 3. So, I'm used to subscripting, but I've also seen it not subscripted, just saying. This is going to be 15 pick 3, which is 15 over 15 minus 3, all factorialed. And, uh... Then we have divided by 3 factorial. So, in this case, because 15 factorial divided by 12 factorial on your calculator is actually probably going to take longer than just multiplying, there we go, and divided by 6, which is 3 factorial, 455 ways. Be advised that you basically generally need a scientific calculator to be able to deal with factorials well. Probability of composite events. What if we have multiple events that are happening in sequence? Well, if you have two independent events, the chance of A and B is equal to the chance of A multiplied by the chance of B, because they don't affect each other's chances. You can think of it as... On a probability scale, let's say the chance of A is this much. P A. This is a unit square, by the way. This might be P B. This is a unit square because the overall 
probability in total is 1. You're always going to get something. 0 is impossibility. So this would be 1. This would be 1. Now what would this area be of PA and B? Well, you just multiply these two fractions together. If A and B are dependent, i.e. the chance of probability B after A is not the same as just the probability of B, then you have the chance of A happening multiplied by the chance of B happening after A happens. You can also write it like this, PA times P B given A. I usually omit the dot product symbol here. Okay, so let's say we draw a card from a standard deck of 52 cards. We replace it and draw another card. Find the probability of the first card being the three of hearts and the second card being the two of clubs. The second card's probability, because we replace the first card, it's still one card in 52. No, we are not cheating and remembering where we replace the first card to, okay? That's important. So, probability of, two of three of hearts, so H3, and two of clubs, C2, is equal to the probability of H3 times the probability of clubs 2. So, we're dealing with 1 over 52 times 1 over 52, which is equal to 52 squared 1 over 2704. Okay, what happens if you have mutually exclusive events? If you have the probability of one or the other, then you just add their probabilities. Like say you have a spinner with nine sectors of equal size, and what's the chance that the spinner will stop on seven or an even number? P seven or even. Well, we know that it can't stop on an even number and stop on 7. So it's the probability of 7 plus the probability of even. 7 and even. Hmm. It's a, just an S apart. Anyway, 7. Yeah, it's going to be 1 in 9 because it's 9 sectors of equal size. And there are... By this standard version of the spinner, you number it from 1 to whatever number. So plus even. The even numbers, there are going to be four even numbers. 2, 4, 6, 8. So four even numbers and 9. Which means you're dealing with 5 in 9. This is the probability that the spinner stops on 7 or an even number. Now let's say we draw cards from standard decks of cards. The card is not replaced and the second card is drawn. Find each of these probabilities. Probability of getting a 4 and then an 8. Well, there are 4 4s out of 52 cards times still 4 8s out of 51 cards. So if we cancel this, we get a 1 and a 13. So, 13 times 51 is 663, and the numerator is 4. Probability of Queen of Hearts and 10 that's going to be one card in 52 times four cards remaining in 51. You can cancel and give you 
663 again for 13 times 51 and on top we get 1 in 663. A card is drawn from a standard deck of cards. Find each probability. The chance that you get a queen of clubs or a red card is equal to, well, it can't be both queen of clubs and red. Red is diamonds or hearts. So, queen of clubs, clubs, queen, plus P, red. 1 in 52 plus 1 half or 26 in 52 so you get 27 over 52 this is the chance of getting a queen of clubs or a red card now getting a queen of hearts or a 10 you're dealing with 1 in 52 plus 4 in 52 because it's a card is drawn so this one card is going to be one of these outcomes if it's a favorable outcome or not them if it's not a favorable outcome it's not the same as two cards drawn in sequence problems so the chance you have five favorable outcomes out of 52 if you want a queen of hearts or a 10 for your one card drawn. Well, that's it for this chapter. This time we discussed data management a bit and we talked about probabilities a bit. Next chapter, we get to talk about something that doesn't require quite as much workarounds and is a little bit more uh, brute force. Namely, we're going to be talking about algebra, starting with polynomials. So, see you next chapter.